Hello, everyone. Good to see such a nice crowd uh, tonight. Uh, this is after two years of uh, no programs because of COVID. The Weimar Judaic Studies Institute is very happy tonight to welcome you and welcome Dr. Drew Johnson, who's uh, going to be speaking to us tonight. I think the title we gave it is, Does the Hebrew Bible Have a Unique Philosophy? I know you're not here. For, he will speak for about 45 minutes, followed by maybe 10, 15 minutes of questions. Uh, just in terms of biography, um, as I said, he teaches at King's College, the, the King's College in New York. Uh, rather than tell you about all his articles and his books, a number of books on different themes, I think especially the students would be interested to know that his background's a little more unconventional than many of us. I'll just It's on his website, so it's fair game, right? Uh, in addition to his punk band, in addition to serving seven years at the Air Force, including a number of them in Colombia doing counter-narcotics. Uh, in addition to uh, being an ordained Presbyterian minister who's worked all over, including in Kenya and in Scotland. Uh, well, you get the point. There's a lot more I could say. We had a wonderful dinner, and uh, I'm sure you'll find the talk very interesting. So without any further ado, Dr. Drew Johnson. Okay, I, I should mention at first, the, the punk band was in the 1980s, so it's been a while, right? That's a, that was a long time ago. Um, they don't turn off their phones. Yeah, you don't need to tell these people that. Like, that's, that's a middle-aged problem. And the ones whose phones are ringing. Okay, well, thank you. I'm glad you guys volunteered your time to come out tonight for no credit whatsoever. That's impressive. Okay. Uh, just, re just trying to read the room, see where you guys are at. Um, so I, I'm going to be talking tonight about uh, does the Hebrew Bible have a unique philosophy? Just to be clear, when I say Hebrew Bible, I mean what Christians refer to as the Old Testament, the same literature, um, what is also called the Tanakh. Uh, but does it have a unique philosophy? Uh, and for many of you, you might think, like, I don't even know what this question is hinting at. If you're a scholar, you'd be like, that's a really controversial question to ask. That's a provocative question to ask. Um, and so, oh yeah, I have to do due diligence here. I, I'm the director of the Center for Hebraic Thought at the King's College in New York City. And so what we do at the center is basically think about how did the biblical authors think about their world? The, sur surely they had thoughts about how the world worked and how did, what did they think about? How did they think about the nature of good and evil, which is surprising, some of the things that they thought? Or did they think about anthropology? What are humans? How are they related to creation, environmental issues, justice? Um, there's obviously no policing, there's no jails in the Hebrew Bible, right? So there's no, a whole system of justice that has no policing or incarceration built into it whatsoever. So what, is, what does a justice system look like where you have no police and you can't throw somebody in jail and throw away the key? So they have all kinds of thoughts uh, that are sophisticated and we wanna explore one of them tonight, but I, I wanna make a basic claim. Oh yeah, my publisher would wants me to put this up there. So now you've seen it, we can move on. Think of these ancient, we can call them cultures, we can call them civilizations. We can even say, think of these different parts of the world. They're locations that have their own people groups, their own languages, their own intellectual traditions. So we could even put the American intellectual tradition up there if we wanted to. But we're keeping it in the ancient world. We're keeping it in the ancient Near East, if that's over here, and a little bit of Greece over here, right? And a little bit of Rome right over here. So we're in the Mediterranean basin. If you think about not just the architecture of these societies, uh, which some of these, I'm calling them societies or cultures or civilizations, some of them lasted thousands and thousands of years, right? Um, but if you think of Mesopotamia, so the Assyrians and the, um, and the Babylonians and the Persians and the Medians, you think of Israel, the, the literature that's produced by these people. So Israel, we would have the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. Think of Egypt, what kind of literature did they produce? Well, a lot of it that, that exists, that we know of, exist on walls in Egypt. So you actually have to go to Egypt and read the text on the walls. But they also had papyri and uh, they wrote like the Book of the Dead. They have a lot of wisdom literature. Think of Greece, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, the tragedies, the plays, all the literature, the culture that comes with that. And of course, Rome. Um, and so think of each one of these bubbles as representing a culture, a people, a place, an intellectual tradition, and all the literature that goes along with that. The rituals too, the, t the food, all that kind of stuff, but just think of the literature that they produced. If you were to, this is a real question to you, if you were to group these up, say I put two buckets up here, 
and you had to take these five balls and you had to separate them by which ones were like the other ones, right? Like a Sesame Street game. One, of the, one or two of these kids are doing their own thing, right? How would you separate these five cultures? And maybe you might be embarrassed to say to yourself, here's how I would do it. So maybe you could just say, how would somebody out on the streets uh, separate these five cultures according to affinity, how they're like each other? Anybody want to throw an idea out there? You can't, you can't go wrong. This is, yeah. Okay, so location, so how would that separate then? How would you then, which, uh, which ones would go with which? I would do Greece and Rome. I mean, Greece and Rome go together like peanut butter and chocolate, right? I mean, they even have a hyphenated word, Greco-Roman, right? Uh, and so what would we do with Egypt, Israel, and Mesopotamia? They go together? Just thinking about the kind of literature they produce, the Old Testament, um, the wisdom literature of Egypt, the death text, uh, omenology, dream interpretation, same thing in Mesopotamia. Okay, so I, I, I can see you're thinking too hard about this. So here's how most people divide it up, is they put Greece and Rome in one bucket, and they put Israel in Mesopotamia and Egypt in the other bu bucket, and part of that is because of location, right? The Israel is closest, it sits between, on the ancient Fertile Crescent, it sits between Egypt and Mesopotamia. Uh, to my surprise, when I started researching for this latest book, uh, I found that actually if you talk to ancient Near Eastern scholars, so the people who study Mesopotamian literature, they're the ones who study, they can read cuneiform and all the different languages that are written in cuneiform. Um, you talk to Egyptologists, right? Uh, theirs is a little more self-explanatory. They can read the hieroglyphs. They can read all that Egyptian literature. <clears throat> this is how they divide it up. They say the Hebrew Bible actually belongs over with the Greco-Roman tradition, like Socrates, Aristotle, Plato, the philosophies of this world. This is a little bit surprising to me. These are people even uh, almost a century ago. So this guy, Henri Frankfurt at the University of Chicago, and if you don't know, University of Chicago is one of the premier ancient Near Eastern study centers in the world, right? The Oriental Institute there. Oriental here means ancient Near Eastern, not uh, Central and East Asian. Uh, he says the Hebrews, and he's, he's just talking about the Old Testament. He's not talking about some secret text that you've never heard of or some tablet that was dug up somewhere. He's talking about the text in the Old Testament. The Hebrews were without peer in the power and the scope of their critical intellectualism. And then he goes on to say, it was only by the virtue of their skeptical mood that the Hebrew thinkers were able to attain a view of our world that still shapes our outlook today. Um, and you might be thinking to yourself, self, am I reading the same Old Testament this dude is reading? Like, was there a different Old Testament floating around in 1946 when this guy's writing? Uh, in fact, he goes on to make a stronger claim uh, that if you want to trace the Western world, how we do democracy, how we do justice, in our, in our best forms, right? So how do we think about the equality of humans that me and you are equal of equal value. Um, just because she's female and I'm male doesn't make me a lesser person or her a greater person. Um, if you want to trace all of these ideas that we think are generally good about the Western world, you can't trace them to the Greco-Roman world. And if you read anything in Gre Greek or Roman literature, you're never going to walk away thinking like, oh, we're all equal to each other, right? Uh, and so these scholars are advocating that Really, most of the ways we think about the world, including the scientific enterprise, comes uniquely through the strand of thought from the Hebrew Bible forward into the Western world, but it also goes east and south as well. Uh, there's even um, a guy named Tom Holland, who is not the actor. Uh, he's actually a classicist at Oxford University. He's on Twitter right now. You can go look him up. Tom Holland, I think it's Holland Tom uh, on Twitter. And he's constantly reminding people Everything that you think is good and decent of value, ethics, justice, notions of humanity, the, the ones that we stick to today, uh, they all came from the Christian world. He says Christian, he's British, he doesn't know any better. Everything he says is Christian is actually from the Torah of the Hebrew Bible. Just everything in the Torah gets pushed forward into the New Testament. So my question was, uh, does the Hebrew Bible have a unique philosophy? There is a, a more problematic question under that, which is, what counts as philosophy? Um, you can imagine, well, here's what I thought. In, in my naive moment, and this was just a few years ago, I thought, okay, I'm working on this big book. 
I'm going to start by, you know, looking at the definitions of philosophy, uh, get the most, you know, the most agreed upon definition of philosophy, and then compare the Hebrew Bible to that and see how it compares, right? Uh, and I have a master's in philosophy, so it's not like I didn't know anything about philosophy, but I was a little shocked to find out, it's kind of, uh, there's a saying, is it ask two rabbis, get three opinions, or something like that? Um, ask 10 philosophers to define philosophy and get 15 definitions, right? And they don't agree with each other. It's not like they're definitions where you say, yes, all of those clump them together. Some of their definitions exclude other definitions. So there's a, a debate about, I mean, you can have two philosophers working in the same philosophy department that don't agree about what they're doing. They think they're doing different things. That's not a problem. I don't, I'm not too worried about that. Um, but so when I say what counts as philosophy, I really want to say there is something in Hellenistic literature, in Roman literature, Egyptian, Mesopotamian, and Hebrew literature that we can say there's a philosophical style to what they're doing. There's a way that they reason about the nature of things. So think of scientific style of reasoning. Everybody here has had to take some kind of science class or you're looking at me like I have horns on my head. OK, yeah, so you've heard of science. We all know about science, right? Um, yeah, and so scientists, if you've taken any kind of biology or chemistry, they have a, a particular way of thinking about the nature of biological reality or chemical reality or physics, right? So, uh, and when you read scientific literature, you can quickly figure out, oh, this is very, this is like a scientist must have wrote this because th this is how scientists think about the world, right? I just want to say there's something like that as well in the Hebrew Bible, Old Testament, uh, and there's something like that in all of those other traditions as well. Okay, I'm going to skip this. Now, if, if you know the Old Testament at all, you know that it has a collection of literature within it that has been commonly called wisdom literature. Um, so Job, some of the Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, that saucy, sexy Song of Songs. If you haven't read that one, it's scandalous. Which many ancient, ever, has anybody heard of Song of Songs? It's got all kinds of seductive analogies in there. Um, don't read it in a weak moment. Uh, many Jewish rabbis thought that, this, that that piece of wisdom literature was actually about mathematics, believe it or not. Um, but this is called the wisdom literature, so you think like, oh, if we're going to look for philosophy, philosophy is uh, phileo, sophia, the love of wisdom, I think you'd go to the wisdom literature. That would be the obvious place. So in this book that I was referencing earlier, I don't talk about the wisdom literature at all, because that's the low-hanging fruit, right? I said, I was thinking, if we're going to think about a philosophical tradition, a style of reasoning about the nature of reality in the biblical text, uh, let's go with the Torah, which has a bunch of weird stories, poetry, legal reasoning, long wit list of things. Um, and we can see if they're doing something philosophical in those texts. And if that's true, then we can put the wisdom literature in conversation with it. OK, so what is the philosophical style of scripture? I, I would say there are genetic markers that if you had you know, I'm in a work group with a bunch of Egyptologists and Assyriologists and Hebrew Bible people and, and classicists. And, you know, my thinking here is that you could set some text in front of us and we could all come to agree through the expertise of some of us. Like, oh, this is clearly a Roman text. Who, whoever wrote this, this is a Roman text, right? Because it's, it's clearly taking Greek ideas, but that's pushing them in this new Stoic direction or something like that. The idea is that, that you could set a text in front of somebody and they could say, this is a very Hebrew way of reasoning about the nature of the world. Um, and so what are those genetic markers that identify the Hebrew way of, of, of re sorry, reasoning about the world around us? I, don't worry, I'm going to give an example at the end. We're going to talk about the nature of truth as one example that they reason about. So there are, there are six genetic markers that I think are going on. There may be more going on. I just put these out there as ones that I think are obvious and uncontroversial. The first is, um, if you think about the worst argument you've ever been in with someone where, that's really logical, and they're just trying to line up, you know, they're like, oh, I don't want to talk about this. Let's just start with point A, and do you agree on this, and then go to point B, or if you've ever been in a courtroom, you know, is it true, yes or no, that A is true, right? And this is the way that we tend to think about how you really ground arguments, is that you give premises that argue in a line, a straight line towards a conclusion. You've probably heard the syllogism or something like it. All men are mortal. 
Socrates is a man, therefore, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Socrates is mortal, right? It's premises that lead necessarily to a conclusion, like one plus one is two, right? It, 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 it must be the way and it can be no other. So that's how we are most comfortable with what we consider solid arguments. Um, the biblical authors, uh, anybody here, I, now I, lo I, I didn't even think about it until this very moment. I usually ask the question, anybody here ever seen the American office? Okay, yes, sorry, that's cliche here in this town, right? Uh, anybody remember Robert California? Yeah, okay, so Robert California is actually probably doing something closer to what the Hebrew Bible is doing. You ask him a simple question like, are we all getting fired tomorrow? He's like, let me tell you a story about when I was in Thailand, right? And then he finishes that story is like, and did I tell you about the cricket that could take on the elephant just by, you know, and, and he tells like four stories in a row and you're like, what the heck are you talking about, right? Um, something like that is going on in the Hebrew Bible, except for I think Robert California was doing it to basically get out of answering the question. Uh, and in the Hebrew Bible, they're actually trying to answer the question. They're sculpting the concept so that you can see what is the thing that you should be paying attention to. But they do it by telling you a story here, telling you another story, have a piece of poetry attached to that story that explains what's going on in this story, telling you, uh, giving you some legal reasoning that has to do with the story that you just read. And we'll look at an instance of this later. So it's, uh, if I can give you an example, <clears throat> this is uh, a Seurat painting. You guys have seen pointillist paintings before. Uh, you, could, you could say the same thing about your phone. Right? Your phone is just a bunch of millions of pixels that can display, I think, four colors, if that's correct. Um, so the same thing here. George Seurat uh, was part of the pointillist painting movement, and all that painting is is a series of dots of paint. That's all he did, right, is he dotted the canvas. So if we notice the square here, we're going to focus in <clears throat> on the man's head. And if you look at this painting, okay, A, notice that you can immediately see the figure from the background the head from whatever's behind the head, the curtain or something, right? You can notice that. And you can notice that uh, because the various dots are related to each other in such a way that your, your visual field can kind of figure this out from experience. Okay, this is a mustachioed man of some sort, a profile in front of some kind of curtain, right? Uh, but notice if I said, well, what's the meaning of this dot right here? That dot doesn't have any meaning unto itself, right? This dot gains meaning when it's networked with the rest of the dots, right? This dot, dot only has meaning in as much as it participates with the other dots in the image. Um, and so I think when you read across the Old Testament, when you get all of these stories that sometimes seem to be randomly placed or very bizarre stories, uh, or they seem bizarre to us, um, what you're actually seeing is pixels that are meant to be networked together to think about how they're related to each other. So the second, uh, the second genetic marker is networking, meaning that when you put the pixels together, they kind of tend to point in a direction. Now you can think of like, well, how do you know which stories are networked together? How do you know which parts go together? One easy way is repetition of language. Um, that, that doesn't always get you there, as we'll see in the example I'm going to give about truth. Because sometimes the thing that you're talking about isn't even mentioned by name, but it's, you're clearly talking about that thing. Um, so it can be a term like truth or evil or knowledge or power or something like that. It can be a concept that's attached to a word. Um, but it can also just be like a genre that's repeated. So for instance, uh, can anybody here like thumbnail for me the story of Sodom and Gomorrah? Without moralizing it, just tell me like what happened at Sodom and Gomorrah. Quick, they're coming. <laughs> Nobody knows the story of Sodom and Gomorrah? That's such a popular one. Go for it. Um, basically, God destroyed the city because of how of the Jews' very heinous crimes. Yep. And the heinous crime specifically there is if foreigners who are vulnerable came into a city all the men in the city gathered together, together to publicly rape those foreigners, right? That's not what we call hospitality, right? That's just not nice. So that's one story. There's another story in the book of Judges. That's in Genesis, so that's early on. There's another story in the book of Judges where, guess what? There's a Hebrew who goes into a Hebrew village amongst his brothers with his wife, his, his concubine, 
And he and someone in the village says, hey, it's not safe out here, drags him into his house, and the entire Hebrew village bangs on the door demanding to rape this man publicly as well. And he ends up, well, I'm not going to tell you how it ends. It ends even worse than it did in Sodom and Gomorrah in that case. Um, that's one of those types of scenes where you go like, okay, it is not accidental that these two stories look like. In fact, the, the story of the Hebrews doing it, in some cases, quotes verbatim lines from the Genesis story to let you know, yep, we are doing that Sodom and Gomorrah thing over here, but now it's Hebrews who are doing that, right? Uh, which creates quite a problem. Um, so that's the kind of networking we're talking about, where it's fairly obvious there's some winking and nodding in the literary art artistry saying, hey, yeah, we're still talking about that thing. Uh, and some of it requires careful attention. Sometimes the English translations aren't going to pick up on some of this winking and nodding, or they're not going to relate it to you. But if you read enough different translations, you'll pick it up. Anybody can pick it up on their own. OK, so those are two modes of argument, that they're going to scatter a concept across very different genres of literature, and they're expecting you to pick up the breadcrumbs and figure out what connects these things together. So notice how different that is than giving you an argument like a syllogism. Here, I'm going to give you premise one, I'm going to give you premise two, and you can see that there's a necessary conclusion that follows from premise one and premise two. It's, it's easy as math, basic math, right? This one is saying, no, 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 you're going to have to pay careful attention over a lot of literature and see why they keep coming back to certain topics over and over again. And they, they you know, I like to picture it as they're creating a field in which this topic exists and they're putting up fences saying, like, no, we're not talking about that over there. We're talking about this over there, here. Okay. I know this is all in the abstract, but we will look at an example here in a second. Now, the last four here of these genetic markers are just convictions that the biblical authors in the Hebrew Bible, I think all of them, basically carried these convictions that these things were true, and, and, and because these things are true, uh, it allows them to reason with us in this particular way. The first thing is they just believe that the earth was, and the cosmos and everything in it was created by God and controlled by God. And I don't mean that in any kind of like seven day or evolutionary creation. I just mean like they had a flat belief that God was in control of everything, right? Um, they also had a ritualist belief. Now this one sounds weird, but it's not. They believed that if you really wanted to know something expertly with skill and discernment, so think of like if you want to be a surgeon, right, a top tier, I don't know what the hardest surgeon, I, I feel like, you know, in utero infant neurosurgery is probably like one of those top, uh, I just made that up, I don't even know if that's a thing. Um, but that's a high, high, high skill, right? If you want to be highly skilled and discerning in an area, then the way you become skilled and discerning is not by working through things in your mind, but it's actually by embodying practices over time, over and over again, in a community that says these are the practices that are trustworthy that will allow you to understand something, right? Uh, that is actually not a controversial view at all. Okay, the way I put it here, it looks like you have to kill goats, right? But it's not a controversial view. If you want to be a surgeon, that's exactly what you do. You go to medical school and you put your body into practices and practices and practices that the medical community says, by doing these practices, you will actually come to understand the body surgically so that you too can strategically harm people for their health, because that's what surgeons do, right? If you just describe a surgery, it sounds like a murder, right? They, he cut them open, they're bleeding all over the place, and he just kept cutting and kept cutting, right? Um, so, but you learn to do surgery by st strategically inhabiting rituals that are accredited by the community in order for you to become a discerning person. Uh, so they believe that too, right? They might be one of the first people on the face of the earth to believe it. They're the, they're the only people in the ancient world that talk about rituals and add the phrase, so that you will know. Do this ritual so that you will know, so that your generations will know, so that your children will know. Uh, the mysterious conviction is simple. They don't think exhaustive knowledge is the goal. They don't think that you're, someone can pull back the curtain and figure out how everything works. Uh, Deuteronomy 29.29, 29.28 29, in the Hebrew, it says, The hidden things belong to Adonai, our God, but the revealed things belong to us and our children to keep them and to do them. Right? So it's very clearly saying there are many things that we cannot know. Ecclesiastes as well, uh, or Kohelet as it's called in the Hebrew, uh, if you read that, you, you end that wisdom literature by, I mean, it says flat out, if a wise man claims to know things, they don't. Don't listen to them, right? So it's, it's delineating that we will not be able to know everything. And you're like, 
I know what you're thinking. What schmuck thinks that we can know everything or that that would solve everything by knowing everything? Believe it or take a history of philosophy class sometime. Like the, this was Plato's goal at one point. There, were, there was actually attempts, even in the 20th century, there were living, breathing human beings who thought they were going to solve everything by figuring everything out mathematically. This is a true story. It's crazy. Um, I'm glad you all are like freaked out by that. That means you're normal people. OK. The most radically unique thing about the Hebrew intellectual tradition is the last one. It's actually all of these other ones, the pixelation. Like, you can find Stoics that pixelate arguments a little bit in the Roman Empire. You can find, you know, everybody believed that there was some kind of divine creation going on. Many, even Socrates and Plato used rituals uh, in order to bring out knowledge from people, right? So you can see elements of this in all of these other traditions. Not this one. I'm calling it trans demographic. And if you look, OK, the picture doesn't look so hot here. I, looks great on my screen. Um, but what I'm saying here is this intellectual tradition is available to this kid. It's available to this old guy. It's available to this, this old woman over here. It's available to everybody equally. And not only is it available in the Hebrew tradition, but it's demanded of everybody. It's not that you can become wise and discerning. You're actually, you have to become wise and discerning in order to participate in this project for the sake of all the families of the earth. OK, um, I won't do that. I'm going to stop and ask, does anybody have a question of clarification before we go on? Because I want to give an example about truth. There's truth. I'll do that, but not yet. And if you have a question which you're like, this question is too dumb, I'm an idiot, I don't understand anything this guy is talking about, you probably represent at least 50% of the people in this room, right? Everybody's thinking, like, I did not catch that, I didn't understand that. So anybody brave enough? Anybody have the gall? Question me on something simple. Yeah. So this Hebrew part is like Jesus thought. It's like kind of like I think of it as a little bit of a checklist of when we're writing things. Or is it like the whole thing? Like the way I'm reading it as like okay, like I have a picture, I have a network, I have the creation, creationist, atheist, and mysterious. Mysterionist, yeah. And yeah. The last one, I checked all those things off, and now I'm like a part of this like overall grand. Um, man, okay, great, great question. So as, we, as, as, Jew, as Hebrew tradition becomes Jewish tradition, which is a whole complicated story, um, yeah, Helen, Greek, the Greek tradition comes in and actually it gets hybridized. So like some bits of Hellenism take over some of these elements. So yeah, I'm saying that when we're in the Hebrew Bible, they are largely, like when you're looking at the text, they're committed to all six of those. Those are the genetic markers that distinguish it. Um, so I'm, I'm saying they're not a checklist like somebody's writing these texts going like, oops, I need to make sure and hit the trans demographic element here. Uh, but rather that because they live in this intellectual tradition, it comes out of, that's the way it comes out whether they like it or not. Like because you live in the American intellectual tradition, I don't have to remind you that you think of everything individualistically. It's like talking to a fish about water, right? Like we just automatically process everything on how does it affect me? I'm a free person. Nobody can tell me what to do. You go, girl. Whatever it is that gets you going in the morning, right? Or now you need a hype man, right? In a minute, I'm going to need a, someone to hype me up. OK. So yeah, it's a great clarification. This is just in the water. And this is the way they operate on a good day. So if it went the way it if you read the Hebrew Bible, you know they often did not operate this way. It goes downhill in all kinds of ways. They commit all the atrocities that, they, that are, have oppressed them over the years. <clears throat> so on a good day, this is how it would have gone. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, I just ran right over that, didn't I? Um, so he's somebody who's expert in all of these ancient Near Eastern texts, and he's looking over the Hebrew Bible, and he's saying, okay, what you don't see, Mesopotamia is an incredible, like, the Greeks even freaked out when they went to Mesopotamia, and they saw what the Mesopotamians did in their, in their wisdom traditions, and said, how do these people do this, right? How do they know so much? How do they operate in four different languages si simultaneously? Some languages that have been dead for 2,000 years. So they're, they're clearly in uh, a scholarly tradition. However, um, 
when you turn to the Hebrew Bible, what, what they're not doing is they're not thinking like, okay, what is the nature of justice apart from someone I know getting robbed, right? They're not thinking about what is the higher principle that ties an injustice to me to the, an injustice to you, where we can both say that it's the same kind of injustice that comes between us. Now, they probably were thinking about this, they just don't put it in their literature. So we can't see their thinking, if I say it that way. So we turn the Hebrew Bible to see open conversations, extended conversations, and pictures and, uh, and stories over and over again of injustices and justice and when it's maintained and when it's not. As Aristotle says, you define something by saying what it is and what it isn't, right? And you see that throughout the Hebrew Bible of what justice looks like, what inappropriate uses of political power look like, um, what good looks like, what evil looks like, what truth looks like. So yeah, it's a great question. This, this is what he's looking at and saying like, oh, they are really critically slicing and dicing like how the world works. And you just don't see that in Egypt or Mesopotamia. I didn't know this until recently, until I joined these work groups with these people. And I was like, oh, wow. I mean, I was at a conference in Germany this summer with these, uh, these people. And they were like squeezing clay tablets, like blood from a stone, trying to get a little bit of philosophical speculation out of it. And I'm just over here with my Old Testament flipping page after page going, oh, yeah, we're doing this on every single page, right? So it's, it's a radical difference, which that's why they put them, I think, over with the Greeks and, and the Romans. The skeptical mood, I'll get to the skeptical mood in a second. We'll, we'll see. You know, I always ask my classes at the beginning of the semester, I'm like, okay, if you think there's a God and God comes to you and says something, like he says, I want you to go to 7-Eleven, or you have quick check here, right? Uh, I want you to go to quick check, right? Um, what should your response be if, if you really believe this really was God talking to you and you didn't have a mental health issue that might have mitigated, right? Um, and most of my students will say something like, well, if it's God and he's telling you and you know it's God, then you have to do it. I'm like, okay, well, we're getting ready to read a lot of text where God comes directly to people, he verifies that he's God, they believe that he's God, and God says, do this thing, and they're all like, mm, nope. Or, hey, this sounds silly. This sound, this sound, this is not going to work. Are you sure you know what you're doing, right? So we get a lot of skeptical mood, even when it's divine proclamation. Um, okay, let's talk about truth. Um, and if I can ask you to take all of your thoughts about truth and throw them out the door for a second, and let's just talk about if we can think about a Hebraic notion of truth, um, because it's going to be similar but different from most of our notions of truth today. So uh, the most popular notion of truth in philosophy, if, if there, have, there was a survey that came out a few years ago where they asked phil professional philosophers, what view of truth do you think is basically the right one? And they gave this what's called the correspondence view of truth. You know, if what we think about something corresponds directly to the way the thing actually is, um, then it's true, right? And that seems very common sense, rational, like, I know what you're thinking, what is wrong with that? That sounds great, right? <clears throat> so. Uh, if I think that the sky is blue, and then, oh, sorry, the sky is actually blue, then my belief the sky is blue is true, right? This, this is not rocket science. If the sky is actually red. I lived in Scotland, so that they don't even know what color the sky is. All they've seen is clouds up there, right? So, and, and what this doesn't account for is things like, is the sky blue right now if you're to step out and look up at the sky? No. Is the sky blue when it's cloudy? Is the sky blue at sunset? Sky blue from the space station looking down uh, into the ocean? Uh, no, actually the sky is not blue a lot of the time. Maybe even the majority of time for most people. Um, so what do we mean when we say the sky is blue? We mean something like, well, if you're standing on a particular spot on the Earth looking up at a particular moment without certain meteorological conditions, at the right time of day, it appears blue. Like, okay, well that's a lot of qualifications, right? I get you, but what do we do with all of these qualifications? But this is the standard view of truth. It's time slice. It's like, okay, at this time, I have this belief, and it actually corresponds to the nature of reality. Um, so I want to begin by suggesting uh, that the Hebrew Bible, and this is going to be various spots in it, is going to lay out an argument over time, right, and in various places that truth is actually something closer to this. This is I'm stealing this from a friend of mine, Yoram Hazoni. He's an Israeli philosopher. Um, he says it much more clearly than I used to say it. Truth is that which does what it ought to do over time and circumstance. 
right? And so you have these three words for tr uh, that are related to truth in Hebrew. There's more than that, but <clears throat> these three key terms, aman, where we get amen from. Have you ever heard someone say amen? That's aman, amet, and amuna, right? Uh, and they're all related words. They're all what we call cognates of each other. So if something is true, if it does what it ought to do over time and circumstance, uh, that's what the truth is, which this, the, the word truth is actually used slightly differently than the way we use it in English. And because something does what it ought to do over time and circumstance, you can trust it. It's faithful, right? It also means that it cannot do what it's supposed to do over time and circumstance. So if you ask me, Drew, are you true to your wife? I would say, well, for 25 years, yes, I have been. But there's tomorrow, right? So this is the problem uh, that our notion, that corresponding notion of truth doesn't quite get to take a bite out of, which is um, we have a kind of a light switch view of truth. Something is either true or it's false. Twixt and twain, it can't in be, be in between one of those. But the truth is there's things that are true that can turn false or they can be less true, right? Uh, so in the Hebrew Bible, they'll talk about things like tent pegs are true. Like, how the heck can a tent peg be true? All right. We're thinking about how can a tent peg be false. Well, a tent peg, if it does what it ought to do over time and circumstance, over winds and rain, then it's a true tent peg. That's what it's supposed to do. Uh, roads are true in the Hebrew Bible. There's a lot of things that are true, but roads. So if the road is labeled to Damascus, and you go down the road and you travel over time and circumstance, you end up in Damascus, that's a true road. Reports are true. Uh, now, this sounds like a correspondence one. You hear something, okay, I don't know if you've ever heard, uh, they used to say hot goss, and now they say the tea. What are they, what's the most recent version of this? Is tea still? Okay. Yeah. So you hear someone smack talking uh, on some forum, right? And then you try to figure out whether it's true, right? So notice the time and circumstance issue in the Hebrew Bible is you're supposed to go figure out, you've heard a report of something going on, and you go and you talk to, in the Hebrew uh, tradition, it's very important, not one person. This, actually, this might be good general wisdom. You never talk to just one person. You have to talk to at least two people to confirm over time and circumstance of a different testimony whether something is true or not. And if it's true, it's trustworthy. Right? So a ladder that has held up over time and circumstance is trustworthy to be used. Um, the other end of that is um, shaker, which is uh, false, typically translated as false, which means shaky. It's not trustworthy because it doesn't do what it ought to do over time and circumstance. Okay, let me give you a visual, a visual aid. That's not the visual aid we wanted. Oh, I skipped over it. Hold on. Where's my visual aid? Okay, oh, we'll come back to these other ones. So think about a sailboat. I don't know if any of you sail. I don't. I just assume this is all true. Um, you know, I want to go. I want my boat to go from here to shore on that location, and so I have a, a route in mind. But sailboats never go directly on a route. They have to tack and bob and weave, right, with the wind. And so notice we have two routes here, and one is truer to the route over time and circumstance of wind and seas. One is truer than the other. But notice. Just because this one is the truer route doesn't make this one the false route. Right? Because it's measuring over time and circumstance, which means that, um, I think I have it here, that truth is something that has to be personally discerned and checked over time. And it's something that can change, right? This is a broader idea than just merely correspondence. I have a fact in my mind, and it turns out to be true. It's not permanent. It's like my faithfulness to my wife is not permanent. It's something that can change. Um, and it requires discernment. And we'll look at this uh, in a second here, more how it works. Okay, so let's begin with a really obvious example. So remember I said the word, the word doesn't actually have to show up in the Hebrew Bible in order for them to be talking about the idea. So if you, if you know anything about Genesis, you probably know there's a story about a snake and two naked people, right? Um, and so the serpent comes into the garden and, it, and the serpent is described in the opening sentence there is the most prudent or wise creature that God has ever created. Right? You're like, that's an interesting way to describe that dude, right? So he comes in and he has a conversation and he basically says these three things. Finally, you will not die. It's, an, it's a double infinitive way of really saying, surely you will not die. 
For God knows that when you eat of the fruit, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing good and evil. So that's the three things. You won't die, your eyes will be opened and you'll know something, and you'll be like God knowing good and evil. Now, anybody, if anybody here knows these te this text in Genesis 3, how many of those things are lies? Your choices are zero, one, two, or three. Yes, sir. I think one. Okay. Dyingly, you will not die. Can you finish the story for us then? Where did where did they die? Uh, I think they're banished from the garden of Eden, and then uh, they died. Yeah. When did they die? How much longer did the man die after that? You're golden. You're golden up to this point. But this is a key point. We got to norm the data here. Anybody know when he dies? 900 years later. By my calculations, 300,000 plus days later. So when Yahweh says, in the day that you eat of it, dyingly you will die, and the serpent says, dyingly you will not die, who's telling the truth? I, I will tell you right now, Genesis 2 and 3, there's no mention of the word truth or false at all. But clearly the story is about who is to, trust, to be trusted, who is telling the truth, right? What about, um, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. You'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So this brave man took on the first one. Anybody want to say, which one of those is a lie? Yeah. Isn't number three a lie? You would think, wouldn't you? Can you tell this is all a big trap? Uh, yeah. So what's interesting is, I, I'm going to go to the next screen, and I, I'm going to show you, word for word, in, in a decent English translation, what the narrator says, right? So not what the serpent says, but what the narrator says. So we already dealt with the death issue. When did he die? Um, the next sentence after they eat the fruit, the very next sentence is, then the eyes of both of them were open and they knew that they were naked. That's the narrator's description, right? So the narrator took verbatim the words from the serpent and put it in the narration and told you that just happened. And then at the end of the story in Genesis 3.22, if you want to check it, God himself talks to himself and says, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. So how many of the things that the serpent said were untrue? Yeah, they were all true, at least in some way. You may, and you have to do some theology to say, well, death began in that day. I'd go, down, I'd go with that, right? But when they, you know, ancient people knew what death looked like. So if you say you're going to die in that day, they, they know what that smells like. They know what they have to do with the body. Right? Unlike us, we usher it away into another medical realm that we don't have to touch it. Right? So here we open the story of Israel with a real humdinger about truth without ever using the word truth or false. And weirdly, you come out of this story where God is the one who's in question. Like, did he not know that they weren't going to die? Did he not have the power to make them die? What's going on here? Right? Don't worry. You have to keep reading. We're in the first three minutes of the movie, so don't think you're going to solve any theological problems by uh, uh, sussing it out here. But notice they're having a pretty robust discussion of truth, and what turns out to be the case is God actually indicts one. So if you read all of Genesis 2 and 3, there's only one time when God says, this is what went wrong. And I'm going to guarantee you probably don't know it because I've been in a room full of theologians and biblical scholars and they'll never cite this. I don't know why it gets skipped over. Maybe you do know it. But God says only to the man, because you listened to the voice of your wife. That's the only time that God says, this is what you did that was wrong. You listened to the voice of your wife. And of course, where was he when he was listening to the voice of his wife? Who was, we, who was he with? Anybody remember the story? Such a short story with such key facts just dropped in there. He's standing next to his wife while they're both listening to the serpent, right? So he's there the whole time. Um, it's a great little story, but it's about truth. Um, okay, so right at the beginning, the question is, who are they listening to, right? It, it, it actually doesn't matter whether the serpent knows the truth or not. They shouldn't have been listening to him. If you follow that logic out, that's where the, the story ends up going. Another story we can talk about is Sodom and Gomorrah. I already alluded to it. But notice the same idea gets sculpted in here. Uh, without the word truth showing up. Then the Lord said, how great is the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah. And this is God speaking. I must go down and see whether they have done all together according to the outcry that has come up to me. And if not, I will know. This is God saying, I got to go down and check it out. He does this at Babel too. Let me go down and see what's going on with these people at Babel. So this is the way God rolls. He comes down to check out whether it's actually happening. 
But notice over time and circumstance, the assumption here is there have been outcries of injustice coming up to God from Sodom and Gomorrah. And now he's going down to check out and see whether they are actually true. And if not, he will know. Um, we'll get into prophets and then we'll leave it here. Uh, in Deuteronomy 13 and Deuteronomy 18, you also have these uh, teachings about if you hear a report of somebody committing idolatry, you shall investigate and inquire and examine and see whether it's true, right? And again, it's over time and circumstance. You go, you travel to the place, you see what's going on to confirm if something is actually true or not. And, and again, that's not correspondence simply. It's you have to talk to various people to see if over their various testimonies what they say aligns. If you've watched cops, you know, the first thing they do in cop is anybody here been arrested? Certainly somebody's been arrested in this room. I can't be the only one. Um, so yeah, first thing cops do when you're in a group, they split you up and, and listen to your stories. We use this as a parenting technique. Like as soon as they come in, we got four kids. Like you split them up, see what they got to say, right? If you didn't know that's what they're doing, it's, it's, it works. Uh, Deuteronomy 13 talks about future prophets. Now, I know you're thinking to yourself, wait, true prophets, false prophets. Hebrew Bible does not make a distinction between true and false prophets, ever, right? Instead, it talks about God says, I'm going to raise up prophets. I'm going to authenticate to you, uh, them to you with signs and wonders. And then I'm going to cause the prophet to lie to you. Why? To test you. To see whether or not you love me, right? To, whether you not... You know my instruction up to this point, whether you follow after this person. Same thing in Deuteronomy 18. This is actually a quote that gets used in the Gospels about Jesus. I'm going to raise up a prophet. I'm going to put my words in his mouth. But he may, he may speak presumptuously, right? Some of the things he says might not be true. So think about the test. Remember I said that trans-demographic was the big one? You're an average Iron Age Hebrew, just doing your thing, right? And a prophet comes into town, what, what they're asking you is to imagine a prophet coming into your town and doing signs and wonders that are incontrovertible. You can say, this is, this is of some divine origin. This is not human origin. And then they begin to speak. They're saying, at the point they begin to speak or act, you now have to discern whether what they're saying or doing corresponds to the instruction you've heard through Moses. And if it doesn't, then you don't need to listen to them. Uh, and you have to do that because God says, look, I'm going to do this whole thing. I'm going to send prophets. I'm going to authenticate them with signs and wonders, and then sometimes they're going to mislead you in order to test you, to see whether you've been swimming in the intellectual tradition, whether you've been paying attention and going along with the discernment process, embodying the practice of the Torah in order to discern. That's a pretty robust view of truth. In fact, if you look in the modern world and you say, who, who actually uses this version of truth? Um, anybody want to guess what I'm going to say? That over, let me put it in... Uh, cute terms. Over time and over circumstances, things are experimented and tested to see whether they turn out to be the way we thought they ought to be. Who does that in a university? Who does it well? I'm getting the I'm done with this talk eyes. So <laughs> as soon as somebody answers this one, we're done. Scientists? Yeah, the scientists. Right, this is actually the the scientific enterprise is the one who has picked up this view of truth and run with it. Right? That over time, if it's true, it ought to be true in my lab here in Scranton. It ought to be true in a lab in Switzerland. It ought to be true, uh, again, and we're not talking about a correspondence view of truth. We're talking about over time and circumstances, different experimentation, different places, following similar rituals that are embodied by these various sciences, uh, that we, they should see some core truth of the matter arise and stabilize. Okay, uh, I will leave it there, but this is what I mean. When we talk about does the Hebrew Bible have a unique philosophy, the answer is yes, uh, but more specifically, it has a unique philosophical style. And uh, if you have any questions about the Greco-Roman tradition, how it compares, we can talk about that in the Q&A. But thank you very much for your steady attention. So we'll open it up for a few questions. I just want to begin, just I'm curious as to why you think... Um, the Bible is telling us that Adam was standing next to Eve. No, because it says that. Well, it, it, it says uh, <laughs> she took the fruit. She took of the fruit. There's four verbs in that sentence. She uh, takes the fruit. She eats the fruit. She gives it to her husband who was with her. Yeah, but you're assuming it's at that time. Yeah, I, I, I think most 
most Jewish scholars think that yeah. he was with. So yeah, I think it's, it's, uh, it's I don't know if it's consensus, okay. but I yeah. think most people see that as he's there the whole time. Okay. It makes more sense also of when God finds the man, he calls out for the man in the garden. He doesn't call out for the woman. He only calls for the, for the man in the masculine Hebrew and says, where are you, O oh man? Uh, and when he says, we were afraid because we saw they were naked, he says, who told you that you were naked, right? He assumes they've been listening to somebody else. Okay, very that, interesting. That they didn't syllogize. I had the also way never. Okay, any comments or questions? We have time for a few minutes. This? Oh, yes. Yes, for your notes, I'll speak slowly. Uh, <laughs> it means that uh, the intellectual tradition is open to everybody, no matter whether they're foreigner, native, male, female, old, young. Which, again, that's the most unique, because that's not even true today. There, I don't know of any intellectual tradition that is genuinely open to anybody, no matter who they are. right? Um, and certainly in the ancient world, intellectual traditions were narrowly constrained to elites and wealth. Uh, for the most part, you have, you have some exceptions, but it's almost entirely a classist, elitist activity. And here you have the Hebrew tradition that's like, nope, it's open to everybody and expected of everybody to some level. Well, then I'll ask one final question. Do you have any thoughts uh, about the idea if it's, you don't adopt the correspondence theory of truth, then truth really can be anything you make it. If it, you know, truth, that, doesn't that lead then? You can deceive the public. You know, if you're going to get to where you want to go, whether it be uh, human rights or whether it be that uh, people are fed properly, all that, you can, anything you say, it can be false factually, but it's true because this is what gets you where you want to go. And, uh, yeah, and that's why I think this view is so important because it, it, it nullifies the view that it can get you where it goes, is that you actually have to attend to things over time and circumstance as they change. And you have to keep coming back to them. So you can't say, this is a true prophet, and they're good always and forever. I mean, you even see this in the Hebrew Bible. A prophet speaks truly in one circumstance and then tr speaks deceitfully in another circumstance or foolishly in another circumstance. So you don't get to just, I mean, I would flip it the other direction. Think of cancel culture, right? The, the whole goal is to basically label somebody as bad so that you never have to listen to them ever again and put them in a box, right? And this is saying, no, no, no. You can be a fool, you can, you can be wrong about something, but you have to keep coming and checking over time and circumstance and see whether it all lines up to something. So I think it's actually putting you in direct contact with, I, I use the term advisedly, objective reality in some ways, and this is why I think science has picked up this use of, of true, is that this is the way people actually interact with reality. So in epistemology, which is a, the philosophy of knowledge, there's been this desire to create like an ideal version of knowledge where you just know this fact and you can verify whether it's true through purely mathematical logic. Um, and there's been a lot of epistemologists that have pushed back over the years, the decades, and have said like, okay, that's some pie in the sky view of knowledge, but that's not how humans actually know things. We can go test these things psychologically. Uh, and so there's been a view that pe people have been pushing back and saying, Let's deal with how people actually come to know things rather than putting some like romantic ideal of knowledge out there as the goal that we should be uh, following. And then let's see what's good about how people actually come to know things. Let's see what's problematic. Let's make, it, make the better part of it better and avoid the worst parts of knowledge as well. So that constant contact with reality is what ideally is supposed to keep scientific inquiry in check. Um, and that's what's lacking as soon as you label something as true or false and then move on. Let me just add one more thing, because I think uh, it fits into what you say. Uh, you know, when, you, when the Greeks would think about, they talk about belief. So I think it's correct to say it's belief that. Mm -hmm. You prove something and you believe that. When the word belief, faith, amunah, is used in the Hebrew Bible, it really doesn't mean belief no. in. It means a belief that. It means belief in. It means to believe in God means to be faithful to God. Right. Allegiance. Allegiance. So, yeah. uh, <clears throat> and the same thing in the New Testament. The exact, yeah. I mean, I think the word faith and belief are so problematic in American English that I don't ever use them in the classroom. I think if you replace the word faith or belief with trust, uh, it does it does something closer to the work. Or some have even suggested um, that you should translate most of the pistuos, the beliefs, into allegiance, showing allegiance to. Uh, to show that strong view that you have to actually put your body into it. Okay, so I want to first. I want to thank uh, Dr. Johnson very much for coming out tonight. It's an honor. And, uh,
Thank you all for coming out as well. Hope you found it enjoyable. Yes, thank thank you. you very much. Okay. Okay, this is great.